fair parade is. What day is the fair parade? Tuesday. 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 Um, I was to remind you to if you that that there's going to be a group of people walking in the fair parade. There's no float for our church or for the for the kids this year, but there's going to be a group from our church that's going to walk in the fair parade and pass out candy and promote Jesus, right? Talk about Jesus and demonstrate a love and devotion and commitment to Jesus. So you're invited to come walk in the fair parade. Um, and so be there ahead of time, I think. Yeah. So, all right. So just wanted to encourage you that. Also be in prayer, continued in prayer for Mike and Mary. Mary's still in the hospital. Mike and Mary, good. Uh, Mary's still in the hospital in Des Moines, battling all kinds of stuff. Um, she's had kidney problems. She's Her ultimate issue is cancer but on top of that she's fighting diabetes and kidney issues and all kinds of stuff so just pray that God will be near to her and comfort her and Mike and it's particularly tricky for Mike to be going back and forth between Des Moines and, and Maquoketa so just be in prayer for that family um, and we're going to just continue to try to come alongside that family and support them through this challenging season of their life. Well, listen, I, the reality is and the truth is that all of us go through challenging seasons. And so I'm going to our call to worship is from the book of Lamentations. I know that's not one that you necessarily often read uh, for your morning devotions because it's a lament to God about our lives and the brokenness of our lives. Um, the writer of Lamentations says that God has driven me away. He's made me walk in darkness rather than light. He's turned his hand against me again and again all day long. Sometimes you feel like that, right? That God is against you and that there's all this bitterness and hardship in my life. Uh, he's made me dwell in the darkness and walled me in so that I can't escape. He's weighed me down with chains. And when I cry out for, for help, he, my, uh, he seems to shut out my prayer. Um, I remember my affliction and my wandering with bitterness and gall. I well remember them, and my soul is downcast within me. You feel like that this morning? That you just weighed down, your soul is downcast, and you find yourself losing heart, losing hope, losing faith? Then the writer says this, Yet this I will remember, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For His compassions never fail. They are new every morning, Great is your faithfulness. The title of the message today is Questioning God's Faithfulness. Well, the, the word says great is your faithfulness. In fact, one of the names of God is the faithful one. He is faithful and true. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for him. It's good to those whose hope is in the Lord. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him. To the one who seeks him, it is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. God has promised to love and deliver and save his people. Sometimes we don't feel like it. Sometimes he, uh, we feel like he's far away, like he's taking too long. But we are going to put our hope in the Lord. His mercies and grace are new and fresh to us every morning. Great is his faithfulness. Why don't you stand with me and worship the faithful God? Yeah. 
upon your sacrifice. 
Lord, thank you that um, just that we have the privilege to and the honor to serve a holy God. Lord, you are perfect in every way, and how blessed we are to have such a perfect and good God. Pray, Lord, that you would bless Nathan as he comes. May his words be your words. Pray, Lord, that our hearts and our minds would be open, that your spirit would move within us that you would be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, now's the time. If you got some kids for Kids Church, can head down, which apparently we all do, right? So that's all of us. <laughs> all right, well... For those of you that are new or visiting today, we have been walking, talking, journeying, studying, teaching through the book of Isaiah, which just so happens to be the longest book in the entire Bible. Um, so we've uh, had a major undertaking here, um, but we're learning a lot. And God is teaching us a lot about himself, and he's calling us back to relationship with him. And we saw last week that... God was bringing hope and sending hope into a broken, dark world through the person and work of his son, Jesus. Um, in, the, in these last few chapters, uh, um, into the 40s and 50s, chapters 40s and 50s, there are several servant songs that Isaiah, uh, there are four different servant songs, and last week was one of them. We saw that the servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, literally snatched victory out of the jaws of defeat by securing our salvation. And if you pick up, we're going to go ahead and go to the first slide here. Um, this is where we ended last week, Isaiah 49, verse 13. And it said, Shout for joy, you heavens. Rejoice, you earth. Burst into song, you mountains. For the Lord comforts his people. And he will have compassion on his afflicted ones. We were talking about that it wasn't just in the old days, in the ancient times, in Isaiah's day, that God's people felt uh, persecuted, abandoned, uh, struggling to make it. Um, they had come a long way since God had delivered them out of Egypt and into the promised land, and they'd been established as a, as a powerful nation, one of the greatest nations on the planet under King David and his son, King Solomon. The kingdom of Israel was in the glory days, and they'd come a long way in the last 300 years till the time of Isaiah was writing this. In fact, They'd been harassed by the nations around them, including Egypt and Assyria. And now Babylon was coming and was going to conquer them. And they were feeling like, where was God? He had promised to be our people. I mean, he had promised to be our God. And, and he had promised to provide for us and protect us and uh, bless us and all of these good things. And now we're in trouble. And there's no place to turn for help. And Babylon's coming. In fact, Isaiah had made a prophecy that Babylon was going to conquer them. And um, those that didn't die in the siege of Jerusalem would be taken captive back to Babylon for 70 years. And so, um, but even in the midst of that mess, God said, I haven't abandoned you. I love you. I'm going to send a redeemer, a savior, a comforter to come. And he's going to deliver you and rescue you. Um, and not just deliver you from your physical painful circumstances, but the greater suffering, uh, the greater salvation that is needed by the people of God is 
uh, saving us from ourselves, from our sin, from our brokenness, from our rebellion against God. That was the big issue. That's why they were going into uh, 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 captivity in the first place, was their rebellion against God, their idolatry, their immorality. They had shook their fist at God and said, we don't want anything to do with you. We know better. We want to go our own way, do our own thing. We don't want, we're sick of you telling us how to live. Too many rules. We're going to live our lives apart from you, and we're going to, and we're going to do just fine. Well, the truth is that when we turn our backs on God and we walk from the light into the darkness, the wheels start coming off. Human society, human relationships start breaking down. Um, and so we need a Savior. That's the point. And, and the message of Isaiah is that God is providing one in the person and work of his son. Now, that was yet to happen some 700 years in the future. And he was declaring this prophetically that I'm not going to just rescue you out of Babylon, but I'm going to send a Savior who will rescue your souls and save you from. I will send a Savior who will save you from your sins, which is the far greater need. And so... What had been seemingly a defeat and they were despondent and sad and wondering if God had abandoned them was now they'd heard the good news of the gospel. The good news that God was going to send a redeemer, a savior, and it was cause for great rejoicing and shouting and singing and celebration. I mean, it's, the gospel is literally called the good news. It's actually the best news of hope for redemption and reconciliation for those who are far from God. But somehow we tend to do this, don't we? Even in the light of God's message of hope and salvation and redemption and reconciliation through Jesus, his son, his people still managed to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. God was snatching victory from the jaws of defeat, and they were snatching defeat right back, right? And I'm sure, uh, listen to what they say. So here's the start of verse 14. So shout for joy, verse 13. Look at verse 14. But Zion said, the Lord's forsaken me. The Lord has forgotten me. So here he's calling them to shout for joy in their weeping in their beds at night, right? I'm sure at one time or another in your life you've been on the receiving mess end of, of negative news or bad news or bad messages or negative messages. Sometimes they come from us. Sometimes they come from around us. I was talking with our men's group this week. We were discussing the negative messages that many people have received and heard from their fathers. Young men growing up saying, you know, hearing, you're never going to amount to anything. You're too stupid and lazy. Um, I know uh, that I have to often go back to my kids and say, I'm sorry because I've lost my patience or my temper with them. I've said things to my kids that I have regretted, and I don't want them going up, growing up with these negative messages replaying in their heads, right? And sometimes these negative messages come from ourselves. We, give, we have negative self-talk, right? What do you say to yourself when life starts coming apart on you, when bad things start happening, when the circumstances around you go from bad to worse and you start losing hope and losing heart and you start feeling despondent and maybe depressed? What are the messages that you speak to yourself? Well, if you're like most people, often the, the most natural response is to play the victim, to moan and to groan about how terrible and unfair life is and how we always seem to get the short end of the stick and we just never can get ahead. And here we go again, we say, you know, right? Oh, this isn't going to end well. Maybe you've said that to yourself. Uh, I'm probably going to lose my job. Uh, I'm probably going to lose my house. I'm, I'm probably going to lose my spouse or my friends. Uh, it's probably cancer whenever we have an ache or pain in our body, right? Life just never seems to work out for us. And so we start speaking negative things in our heads, in our hearts. Uh, here's another one. Everybody's got it out for me. Everybody has it out for me. Life seems to be getting darker by the moment. On and on it goes. We all know the me negative messages that we have in our heads and our hearts. Well, that's kind of the context here of Isaiah chapter 49. It's a series of neg negative responses. Even though God has given his people much reason to hope, they are snatching defeat from the jaws of victory. It's the despondent self-talk of God's people, even after they were told that God had not abandoned them, he was going to rescue them, that the servant of the Lord, Israel's Messiah, was coming to save them and to rescue them. And so the first complaint that flows out from their unthinking despondency is here in verse 14. God's forgotten us. 
He's forsaken us. The God who used to be close and we used to worship at the temple and, and uh, who used to bless us and um, protect us from our enemies has forgotten us. I remember one time when I was on a mission trip to Haiti in the suburbs of Port-au-Prince and I remember us going out. This is a number of years ago. It's pretty crazy there now. It'd be tough to take a team into Port-au-Prince today. It's just chaos in the streets. But um, warlords and gangs and kidnappings and shootings, it's a mess. But I remember coming around the corner in the back alley somewhere and there was a little alcove where about eight young 20-something young Haitian men were there and they had and I got the impression that this was kind of their daily practices. They would pool their pennies at the end of the day, whatever they had managed to scrounge up, and buy one bottle of alcohol that they were passing around and all trying to get enough to get a buzz or get drunk off to drown their sorrows for another evening. And they were passing it around, and I walked up to them, and I didn't really know what to say. I didn't even know if they would understand my English, but I walked up to them, and they said, what are you doing here? You know, I kind of, kind of stood out in that setting. Um, and I just said, listen, God sent me to tell you that he loves you. I, he sent me to tell you that he loves you and he's got, he wants to save you. And they, one of them started ruefully chuckling and shaking his head and said, if there is a God, he has forgotten and forsaken Haiti. And they went back to their drinking. Now, I tried to talk with them and remind them, but what could I say? They, had, they were living in abject poverty. They had nothing. Uh, they had nothing to live on and nothing to live for. They'd lost all hope. And they said, if there is a God, he's forgotten Haiti. Well, I don't know if you've ever been to that place where you've gotten so low that you've made that statement. If there is a God, he's forgotten me. And I'm reminded that we see this over and over again by God's people throughout the book of Isaiah. Remember chapter 40, when, when God came to comfort his people, it was the turning of the page from, from judgment to salvation, from, from, from punishment to, to mercy and grace and forgiveness and rescue and redemption. And he said, comfort, comfort my people. And then they said, and then, but then even as he's giving them a comfort and promising his salvation, then he has to ask them, but why are you complaining, Jacob? Why are you saying, Israel, that my way is hidden from the Lord, that my cause has been disregarded by my God? God's forgotten me. He doesn't care about me. He doesn't care about what's happening in my life. How could they say that? How could they even think that in light of God's promises? Well, it's easy when we take our eyes off of God and the truth and the reality and we begin to hear negative messages and the message of our culture and the message of, of our family and friends and even our own negative self-talk, we can get in a pit of despair really quickly. Even David, a man after God's own heart, wrote Psalm 42 and 43 where he's like, Why so downcast, O oh my soul? Why are you so disquieted and, and frustrated and disappointed and empty within me? This is a man after God's own heart. He'd, he'd completely forgotten God. He said, I've been crying all night. My prayers seem to be bouncing off the ceiling. God is distant from me. I don't know where you are. We feel like God has abandoned us. And they're saying it here again in chapter 49. The Lord has forsaken me. He's forgotten me. It's like when we read today, you know, maybe you've read your devotions in, in Romans chapter 8. If you've never read Romans chapter 8, I would strongly recommend it. Like, read it over and over and over again. There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Who can separate us from the love of God, right? We, 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 we read there that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. But then we look around at our circumstances and we look at our lives and our, we, we actually decide that God has abandoned us, that we have been separated from his love and so here's the question of this chapter and maybe the question of your life today. How does God respond to fearful, depressed, despondent, doubting, unbelieving people? Well, I'll give you the overview and then we're going to jump into it a little bit. He reminds us of who he is, what kind of God he is. He proves to us that he alone is God and there is no other. 
So let's look at, he, he gives us a series of promises here in verse 49. Let's look at the first promise. It's in verse 15, and it's a great one, right? They said, he's forgotten us, and he says, no, I will not forget you. I will not forget you. And he uses two very powerful images to impress upon his people that he will not forget them. The first is kind of a, a rhetorical question that demands the negative response. We got, we got a bunch of mothers in here. So, so listen up to this. Can a mother forget her nursing child and have no compassion on the child she has born? And the answer, of course, is no way. Impossible. Of course not. How could a mother forget her nursing child? This child that she's carried in her womb for nine months. Think about the deep, abiding, and nurturing love of a mother for her newborn infant. There's no greater picture of, of an intimate bond of love and dependency and nurture than that of a mother and her nursing child baby. And so you, you mothers know, and you've experienced this, you, you, you can understand, relate to this. You've literally, you've literally given, given life to this baby. And you've carried this baby in your womb. You've shared your food. You've shared your very lifeblood with your baby. And then after your baby is born and breathes that first breath and cries that first cry, you sustain your baby with your own body, with your milk. I mean, there's a God-designed love and incredible bond between mother and child that's just powerful, incredibly powerful. And I, I dare say all of you mothers would, would and is offering, laying down her life for her child, right? And so now in light of that relationship, listen to what God says his people to, his, to, to, to reassure them. You all know the, the, the love of a mother for her nursing child. Now, a mother, he says this, a mother would sooner forget and abandon her nurse, nursing infant than I would forget you. It's more likely that, a, that a, a, a brand new mother with a nursing infant would forget her child than I would forget you. And so how likely is that to happen? Like zero, right? Here's the second image. He says, though she may forget, though she may forget her child, I will not forget you. And then he says, see, I've actually engraved you on the palms of my hands and your walls are ever before me. Here's the second image. God himself is tattooing, carving the names of his people on the palms of his hands. Uh, when my son Drew was released from prison at the end of last February after seven years of incarceration, he did something that really surprised me, shocked me. He tattooed his prison inmate number, his, his Iowa State Prison ID number on his own wrist. And it surprised me. I was like, wouldn't you want to forget that? Wouldn't you want to put that life as far from out of your memory as possible just to forget it and be done with it and move on? So I asked him why he did it, and he said, so that I never forget, so that I never forget how bad that was and what I learned, learned there and that that memory, memory will, hopefully, <laughs> still praying, hopefully motivate him to keep from ever going back there. He goes, I don't want to ever go back. And I, every time I look at my watch, I see that number and I'm reminded that I don't ever want to go back there. I don't want to forget. I do it so that I don't forget. I was surprised by his answer. And this is kind of the same idea. God says, I have carved your names, engraved your names on the very palms of my hands. And he spreads out his people, uh, his hands to his people. He says, look, you see your names on my hands. You see the marks in my hands. This is maybe even, even allusion when we get to Isaiah 53 of the, the hands of Christ that were pierced for our transgressions, right? He said, I would sooner forget what it cost me to purchase your redemption out of captivity than to forget that you are my people. I don't want to forget. I won't forget. I will not forget you. I've carved your very names on the palm of my hands so that I will never forget you. Do you see how profoundly loved... Loved you are by God. He says, the love of a mother for her nursing infant pales in comparison to my love for you. I don't want to forget you. I haven't forgotten you. All you have to do is see your name written on my hands. And I, I'm reminded of you every day. And yet, in spite of these powerful declarations of love from the true and faithful God, God's people respond, yeah, but... It's been so long, Lord, and, and so much has been lost. And, and so much has been destroyed. It's too little, too late. Um, 
when the, Babylon, when the Assyrians came and when the, uh, the Babylonians came, our children uh, and Jerusalem was laid siege to, our children were killed and ravaged and taken captive and the city's been reduced to rubble and the wall's been torn down. There's no coming back after this. Isn't that evidence that you've forgotten us? Again, arguing with God about whether or not he has forgotten them or abandoned them. Maybe you've felt this way in your life. Uh, I've gone too far this time. It's been too long since I've talked with God. We're not on speaking terms. Uh, if I tried to speak, I don't even remember what to say. And if I did, he wouldn't hear me. Uh, the damage has been done. It's too great. The gulf is too wide. It can't be undone. It's just, I've gone too far. I've done too much. It's too late. That ship has sailed. Um, over the last couple years, Amy and I have learned some hard lessons uh, about letting our adult children go. It's hard because we remember the nursing infant at the breast, you know. We remember these days and how dependent and how uh, loving and kind and nurturing and, and uh, the, the bond that was there. And then they learned to talk and then they learned to walk and then they learned to run away from us. Right? And it's been a, a, a challenging season, even with our daughter Mia, who was just married a few couple weeks ago. Um, and over the last couple years with, with, with our beautiful, sweet daughter Mia, we've had some hard conversations. Frankly, very disheartening at times with her. Some of our conversations ended up with everybody being in tears, myself included, and Mia and, and Amy. And it seemed to us maybe that she was walking away, running away, uh, deconstructing her childhood, her relationship with us, distancing herself from us. And I'll be honest, it's been very painful for Amy and I. It made us feel at times like we'd just been terrible parents. We thought, you know, she's doing okay. Maybe, maybe we got out of this one unscathed, but nope. And so it made us feel like we'd been terrible parents and that we were losing our relationship with our daughter, our sweet little girl. Not so little anymore. But you know what's been a huge blessing in that? Here's, here's, the, here's the end of that story. Even though leading up to the, to the wedding, things got a little tense and a little stressful. As many weddings as I've done over the years, I've never been the, the father of the bride, and that changes everything. Holy smokes. You dads of daughters, brace yourself. Um, but what a sweet time to be able to walk my daughter down the aisle and give her to a a godly young man who made some pretty incredible vows and promises to her, and I'm going to hold them to him. Um, but even in the last week, she just, she just got back from her honeymoon, and she's called me twice in the last several days. Uh, and I was like, hey, what's up? You know, and she's like, nothing, Daddy. I just wanted to talk. And so we talked. And she told me how much she loved me, and, and you know, I heard about her life and her starting her ministry up there at the church in Stevens Point, Wisconsin. And, and I was like, I got off the phone and I looked, at, I looked at Amy and I said, she's back. Our little girl's back. Um, God's so gracious to redeem and restore what we think is broken, right? Listen to the next promise that, give, that God gives to his people in verse 17. I'm going to restore you. I'm going to rebuild you. I'm not only not going to forget you, but I'm going to restore and I'm going to rebuild you. Your children will hasten back. Those who laid waste, uh, who, those who laid you waste will depart from you. He's talking about the Babylonians, even the Persians. Those who had held you captive, who destroyed you, who conquered you, will leave. Lift up your eyes, look around. All of your children are going to gather around and come to you as surely as I live, declares the Lord. And you'll wear your children as ornaments and you'll put them on like a bride, her jewelry, right? They'll be a grace and a garland to you. Though you were ruined and though you were made desolate and your land was laid waste, now you will be too small for the people to live in your land. Those who were devoured you will be far away. What a promise. God again paints this picture of a heartbroken mother grieving the loss of her children. They, many of them had died. Many had been taken captive by Babylon. Think of the grieving Israeli parents whose daughters and sons were kidnapped by Hamas terrorists and being held hostage in Gaza. That's, that's the anxiety, that's the angst, that's the heartbreak, the weeping and wailing that these people were feeling. 
And God acknowledges and understands just how devastating and horrific this Babylonian siege and the fall of Jerusalem and so many being killed and survivors being carried off and into captivity and being held hostage. And God says, yes, this has been hard. I acknowledge that. It's been horrific. It's been devastating. But far from neglecting you, look at what God says. As surely as I live, God swears by his very life that he hasn't abandoned them, that he's not going to abandon them. He doesn't abandon family, never. God doesn't abandon his children, never. And then he promises that not, not only that, that he's going to restore them back to their families. He's going to rebuild the families that have been devastated. Isaiah pictures a, a devastated widow who has lost her children and, and all of a sudden now, She's astonished and she's looking around as with great joy as a multitude of happy, healthy children are gathered around her and she realizes that she's their mom. And her empty sorrow is replaced by joyful fullness and she just, just can't believe it. Joel uh, 2 describes the heart of God for his people who've been ravished. And he says, even now, declares the Lord, even now, even in the midst of your heartbreak, even in the midst of your devastation, even in the midst of your darkest hour. He says, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart, not your garments. Remember the, the practice was back in the ancient time when they were suffering greatly. They would, they would literally tear their, their robe and they would put ashes and, or uh, sackcloth on and, and ashes and dust on their head to, to be a visible outward sign of their suffering, their mourning, their brokenness. He says, but... I don't want you just to tear your robe. That's a, I mean, that's a, that's a sign of it, but I want, you to, I want your hearts to be rent. I want your hearts to be broken. I want this to be a heart level of repentance. Return to me with all your heart. Return to the Lord. Why? Because he's gracious and compassionate. He's slow to anger. He's abounding in love. He relents from sending calamity into your life. Who knows? He may turn and relent and leave a blessing to you. And the Lord... For the Lord was jealous for his land. He took pity on his people. The Lord replied to him, I'm sending you, even after your devastation and all had been lost, I'm going to send you grain and new wine and new olive oil, enough to satisfy you fully. They had been through drought and devastation and a locust plague. And he says, never again will I make you the object of scorn among the nations. I'm going to restore the, the years that the locusts have eaten and you'll have plenty to eat until you're full. And then you will praise the name of the Lord your God who has worked wonders for you. Never again will my people be ashamed. And then you will know that I am in Israel, that I am the Lord your God, and there is no other. Never again will my people be ashamed. God says, I haven't forgotten you. By my life, I'm going to restore you. I'm going to rebuild you. I'm going to rebuild your people. After the conquest of the northern tribes of Israel by Assyria and the southern tribes of Judah by Babylon, the ancient conquerors would kill a lot of people and those remaining, they would take them captive out out of the land and then they would repopulate the land with people from their countries and basically assimilate and obliterate that nation from the face of the earth. And this happened over and over again. Uh, Many, many nations that once lived in that region, they're just... uh, Uh, historical people now. They're not a living people. But God promised, I'm not going to let that happen to you. And by the way, it had never happened before. Never had a big people been so conquered and taken captive that they returned back and were restored back to land. It never happened. So you can understand why they might be a little skeptical. Now he's not just just describing a a population explosion of the Jews in, in Babylon. He's talking about the future of his people, when he restored them to the land. Some of this prophecy has been fulfilled in in our lifetimes, you know, in 1948, returning and restored to the land. Even after the great Holocaust of World War II, there are some 15 million Jews in the world at this time. I think some 8, 9, 10 living in Israel at this time. Um, And God is restoring. And this is not just pointing to Israel. He's pointing to his future people, the church, that's us. We who were once not a people are now a people. Uh, because uh, God's people, Israel, rejected their Messiah, their Savior. 
He said, I'm going to make you a light to the Gentiles, to the nations, to the ethnos, to all the peoples of the world, because God's plan for salvation was never just for the Jews. It was for the Jews first, but also for all the rest of us. And so now we have multitudes upon multitudes of people who have put their hope in God and have been saved and rescued. And now there was once not a people, we're a people, a thriving, growing church. And so God's promises are being fulfilled even in our gathering here this morning. Let's go on to verses 20 and 21. He says, the children born during your bereavement will say in your hearing, this place is too small for us. There's not room for us here in the land. After uh, the northern tribes were captured by Assyria and the southern tribes were captured by Babylon, uh, they said that the land was just a place for wild animals. Nobody, it was uninhabited for the most part overgrown with briars and thorns and weeds and scrub oak and, and wild animals live there. And now, he says, there's coming a day when, they're, when the people in the land are going to say, this is too small, there's not enough room for us. Give us more space to live in. And then you will say in, in your heart, where did all these kids come from? Who bore me these children? I was bereaved, I was barren, I was exiled, I was rejected. Who brought these children up? I was left all alone. But these, where have they come from? It's an astonished uh, Israel, uh, metaphorically speaking, as a widowed mother uh, who had lost all of her children, and now God promises to restore and to rebuild. Even through the hardest and most difficult times, God promises that one day his people will look around in amazement and declare, How is this possible? How did this happen? Where did all these children come from? Where did all these people come from? Sometimes I look around at you and I go, I ask the same thing. What are you doing here? Why are you here? This, is, this has to be God. The growth of the church will be supernatural and far-reaching, so much so that it won't ever be able to be explained by human plans and programs and agency that we did this. No, we didn't do this. God did this. It won't be our faith or our efforts that build this church. Christ has promised to build his church, to build his people. But only God's deep resolve and commitment to show mercy to more and more sinners and to rescue and to redeem and to pull them literally out of slavery and out of sin and death and bondage into the glorious light of his kingdom. That's what will account for the growth of his church and the restoration of his people. And one day... As we celebrate the marriage supper of the Lamb in the kingdom of heaven, we're going to be declaring in utter amazement. I thought I was all alone. But look around. A multitude from every tribe and language and nation is here. How did this happen? Where did they all come from? And we'll be blown away by God's response. Look in verse 22. This is what the sovereign Lord says. See, I'm going to beckon the nations. And I'm going to lift up my banner to all the peoples and they will bring your sons in their arms and carry your daughters on their hips. Kings will be your foster fathers. Their queens will be your nursing mothers. And then they will bow down before you with their faces to the ground. They will lick the dust at your feet and then you will know that I am the Lord. Because only God can do that. Those who hope in me will not be disappointed. Those who hope in me will not be disappointed. God is so sovereign. God is the Lord of heaven and earth, but he's the Lord of human history. He's so sovereign over human history and over the nations that he will bend every power on earth to work for him and for the accomplishing of his redemptive purposes in the world. Redeeming, restoring, rebuilding his people. He's going to use the nations to do that. Think about how he used King Cyrus to send his people back and gave them all the resources they need to rebuild the walls in the temple of Jerusalem. Think how he used King Ahasuerus when Haman had uh, conspired to kill all the Jews in the Persian Empire on one day. And Esther, God raised up Esther and King Ahasuerus for just a time as that. Remember the story of Moses when all the babies of the Jewish people were commanded by the Pharaoh to be thrown into the Nile River, all the male babies anyway, because they were growing too strong and too powerful. And um, Moses' mom and dad, uh, I think it's Amram and Jochebed, 
right? I don't know. Help me out. Anyway, Moses' mom and dad said, uh, we're this, we, we don't feel good about throwing our son to the crocodiles. So we're going to build a boat and a reed. And, and Pharaoh's daughter came down and raised up Moses in Pharaoh's court to be the redeemer, the deliverer, the rescuer. So this is kind of what he's talking about. Kings will be your foster fathers, their queens, your nursing mothers. I'm going to use the nations to bend to my will and accomplish my kingdom purposes in and through my people so that they can be a light to the nations of the good news of the gospel. It's astonishing. And we've seen even in our day how God has used geopolitical circumstances, raising up leaders, taking down leaders, so that the light of the gospel can go even into the darkest regions of the world. All he has to do is beckon. All he has to do is speak, and they must obey. He calls Pharaoh of Egypt and Sennacherib of Assyria, and Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, and Cyrus the Great, and Ahasuerus of Persia, and Alexander the Great of Greece, and, and Roman emperors, when they thought they were, even uh, the Apostle Paul, who was previously Paul, the, the zealot, the zealous uh, Pharisee who was trying to stamp out the church, and by so doing, he spread the flames of it to the all of the known world. They will all do God's, accomplish God's eternal purposes of redemption. And where once they were used, and God has done this many times, used the nations of the world to discipline his people. It's what good fathers do, by the way. They discipline their children. And it's not as a punitive thing to like pay them back for the, wrong they've done me or something like it's it's always to restore back to relationship it's always to reconcile back to relationship and god's going to call the nations back to himself uh and and he will use the nations to accomplish his purposes and then he will use them to protect and to provide for and even return and to rebuild his people and as in these last days as we get closer to the return of the of christ we see that god is orchestrating sovereignly ruling and orchestrating the geopolitical events of human history to spread the gospel and to build this church. He's doing it now, today, right in front of our eyes. Gospel breakthroughs in previously unreached places and unreached people groups are accelerating. Barriers are breaking down. The rise of globalism has facilitated the spread of the gospel, and the church of Jesus Christ is growing. The Most High God is sovereign over the kingdoms of men, he told Nebuchadnezzar, and he gives them to anyone he chooses. And that should give us great comfort in these crazy days that we find ourselves living in, right? We're heading into an election in November in our country, and our world, our, our nation is in some turmoil. There's a lot of hand-wringing. There's a lot of fear-mongering. There's a lot of negative self-talk going on right now. And God reminds you today that he's in control. He's sovereign over the nations. He raises up a president and he deposes a president and he's sovereign over them and he gives them to whomever he chooses. Our hope can never be in a president or of some world leader. Our hope is in God alone. Jesus Christ is the only savior. There is no political leader that can save you. And as God moves and works in this dark and broken world, he says, I want you to know I'm moving and working so that you will know that I am the Lord. And those who hope in me will not be disappointed. Some of you may have in your translations, those who wait on me will not be disappointed. That's that um, expectancy. That's that trust. That's that confident hope, a resting faith in God that he will do. He will accomplish his good purposes and I need not fear. God is making an incredible promise here to his church, to his people, to us, to build his kingdom, to build his church. And, and again, I, I, I shouldn't have to say this, but I do in this day, in this climate. He's not building any earthly political kingdom. This is a spiritual kingdom, hearts and minds. This isn't, this isn't a, a political kingdom from the top down. This is one soul, one heart, one mind at a time who know and love and follow Jesus. And the recurring theme throughout this passage, Isaiah 49, is God's attempt to overcome his people's unwillingness to believe, believe what he says, to take him at his word, to trust him, 
to put their hope in him, to wait patiently on him. In spite of the fact that God calls his people to patiently wait on him, that, that is to take him at his word and believe him and trust in him, they're refusing out of fear or unbelief or impatience. Can we relate to that? God's not doing it how I would do it. He's not doing it when I would do it. If I was God, I'd do it differently. And so they refused to trust him. Instead, they gave up on God. They turned to accommodating and assimilating into the culture of Babylon. They go, it's too far gone. It's too late. God's too far away. He's not going to hear our prayers. We might as well become Babylonians. And I'm afraid that we, the church, in these dark days are succumbing to similar despondency. I don't see the church growing. I don't see it being rebuilt. I don't see the kingdom purposes of God moving forward and advancing. In fact, I see things getting darker and darker. We might as well throw up our hands in dismay and just become assimilated into the culture. Let's just go along to get along. Let's not make waves. Let's not take a stand. Let's not live. uh, Let's not be countercultural and and, uh, cause problems for ourselves. The pressure to conform to the culture around us is relentless and intense. And it often seems that God makes his people wait so long for the fulfillment of his promises that they lose heart and lose hope and give up. But the Apostle Peter calls Christians to be patient and expectant and have faith while we wait, hopefully, patiently. He says this, in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They'll say, where is your God? And where is this coming that he promised? He's not coming. Ever since our ancestors died, everything, his history's going on as it has since the beginning. And then Peter says, but don't forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day. The Lord's not slow in keeping his promises, as some people count slowness. Instead, he's being patient with you and with so many not winning that, wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. You know why he's waiting right now? Because he's merciful and gracious and because he knows that when he returns to separate the believers from the unbelievers, the sheep from the goats, to reward the righteous and to punish the wicked, there's going to be a much bigger category on the wicked side than on the righteous side. There's far more unbelievers than believers, and he wants more to be snatched from the flames and brought out of darkness and captivity and slavery and bondage into his glorious light, into his kingdom. He wants to adopt more children into his family. He wants to grow the family. And so he's patiently waiting for more and more kids to come in. But then he says, Peter says again, this is 2 Peter chapter 3, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. In other words, no one knows when the thief's showing up. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. The earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. It's not going to be a pleasant time when Christ comes to judge the earth. And since everything's going to be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? He's talking to the church. He's talking to Christians. You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God. And listen to this, speed its coming. Mm -hmm. Did you know that we can actually speed the return of Christ? Did you know that? Now, we don't know the day or the hour, but we can actually hasten or speed its coming. How? Well, he says we're called, yeah, let's do it right now. We're called to be holy, live faithful, obedient, godly lives, and boldly proclaim the gospel because he's waiting for others to come to repentance. So we need to be on mission, living faithful, godly, obedient lives, declaring the good news of the gospel, rescuing souls from the fire. Live faithfully, live patiently, obedient lives, and boldly proclaim the gospel in order to hasten his return. But listen, even these promises elicit the promises to rebuild and restore his people. They elicit another negative response by God's despondent, despairing people. Look in verse 24. And they said, well, really, this has never happened before. Can can plunder be taken from warriors? Can captives actually be rescued from the tyrant? It's never happened. You're saying this is going to happen. We don't believe you. But this is what the Lord says. Yes, yes. Yes, captives will be taken from warriors, even fierce warriors, and plunder will be retrieved from the tyrant. And I will contend with those who contend with you. Ooh, that's good news. Dad's coming to beat up the bullies. I will fight for you and your children I will save. I told you that story about in fourth grade when I was getting beat up by some bullies on my bike. They were trying to steal my bike and beat me up. 
bunch of, bunch of eighth grade boys kind of caught me on the corner. And my dad came driving around and screeched to a halt in his truck. And they went, oh! My dad jumped out, big 6'6", 280, starts trucking after him, and they scattered, man. I get, that, I get this image. I will contend with those who contend for you. Dad's coming. And the bad guys are going to run, right? Your children I will save. I'll make your oppressors eat their own flesh. That sounds dramatic. They'll be drunk on their own blood as with wine. And then all mankind will know. That's just a dramatic metaphor for they're going to be totally destroyed. Then all mankind will know that I, the Lord, am your Savior, your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. So you can understand this question because this has never happened before. Never had a people who had been conquered and taken captive ever been returned and rebuilt and restored back to their land. It just, it just hadn't happened. So you could understand the question, that how could this even be possible? Who could possibly be stronger than the Babylonians and King Nebuchadnezzar, right? Or, or than the Persian Empire and King Cyrus the Great who conquered the Babylonian kingdom. He, he was the greatest king of ever. Who could possibly? Who's stronger than the one who's enslaved us? Have you ever felt that way? completely enslaved, uh, absolutely powerless to break, break free, unable to change your circumstances, to get out of the mess you're in, just helpless, hopeless. It's not a good feeling. And they're despairing. You know, it sounds really good, Lord, but we, I, I don't, we don't see how that's possible. And his response is to those who are held captive to his people, I'm coming to get you. I'm going to fight for you. I'm going to contend with those who contend with you. Your enemies are my enemies, and it's not going to go well for them. Even fierce warriors and powerful tyrants cannot hold on to their captives when a superior force is applied. Here was the problem. They underestimated the power of their God. They overestimated the power of Babylon and Persia. In Matthew 12, Jesus asks this question of his disciples, how can anyone break into a strong man's house and carry off his possession unless he first ties up the strong man. In other words, you don't break into somebody's house that's bigger and stronger than you unless you can tie him up and, and, and plunder the house. Then he can plunder his house. And what's he, what's he saying? What's he saying? Well, what he's saying is the things that I'm going to do, I'm proving by, by my actions that I'm the strongest power in the world and no one can thwart my will. I do whatever I please, and it's good. And so he's going to kick down the door of Babylon. He's going to kick down the walls of of Persia, and he's going to bend King Cyrus's will to his own and cause him not just to send the people back to Jerusalem, but send them out with gold and silver and the promises of resources and uh, uh, to, to. for the people on the Transjordan to provide stone and timber for them to build the walls and the temple and the houses in the city of Jerusalem. Unbelievable. And he's saying, those who resist my sovereign will and oppose me and fight against me and my work in the world will find themselves utterly destroyed. And... You know, we're seeing this right in front of our eyes to a certain extent as human society breaks down and devolves into chaos and wicked people literally are self-destructing all around us. You know, the, the, the language we say is they eat their own, right? We're seeing that all around us, so to speak. It's part of God's justice. He says, have it your way, get what you want. If you want to live life independently of me, then you can reap what you have sown. You can experience the consequences of your own actions. As he saves his people, he allows his enemies to reap what they've sown. God's victory through our Savior and Redeemer, Jesus Christ, will be so glorious and obvious that all mankind will have to admit that God is the sovereign God of the universe, that he's the mighty one of Jacob. But even in this last promise, God's people have one last complaint. Let's go to the conclusion here, and we're going to wrap this up. This is what the Lord says. Where's your, mother, where's your mother's certificate of divorce, which I sent her away? Because what, what were the people saying? God's divorced us. God's abandoned us. He's left us to flounder. Boy, divorce, divorce in the ancient world was brutal on the wife. Uh, it her means of protection and provision were stripped from her and it was it made her incredibly vulnerable 
in that culture. And he says, so where's your mother's certificate of divorce with which I sent her away? Or, or, or to which of my creditors did I sell you? This is what they were saying. God's divorced us. God sold us into, into slavery. No, he says, it's because of your sins that you were sold. It's because of your transgressions your mother was sent away. We live in an era of no-fault divorce, right? Where it's nobody's fault. We just grew apart, right? Nobody's fault. We just drifted apart. We, irreconcilable differences, right? That's not what God is saying here. That's not what his people were saying. They're blaming God for all of this. They're blaming God for their circumstances. This is your fault, God. It's because of your, you abandoned us that we're taken captive by Babylon. You're the one that sold us into slavery, handed us over to the Babylonians, and understandably they feel angry and hurt and, and abandoned. But God challenges us. He said, look, okay, pull out, the, pull out your mother's divorce certificate. Pull it out of the file and read it. What does it say? What are the charges? And then God asked him, was it my failure, my unfaithfulness as a husband? By the way, that's the language of the Old Testament. They had a covenant. They had a sacred covenant. So it was like a marriage covenant. I'll be your husband, you be my wife. But, but the basic requirement is faithfulness. That's the basic requirement for any marriage to work, right? Faithfulness. And he says, was I unfaithful to you? Or were you unfaithful to me? Who actually destroyed the marriage? Is it honest or fair or even helpful for you to keep blaming me? on the consequences of your own unfaithfulness and, and rebellion, your, your idolatry and immorality. Back in the ancient world, too, if, if you couldn't pay off a debt to a creditor, it was totally appropriate for them to come in and sell your entire house and all your possessions, including your wife and children, to pay off the debt. And that's what they're accusing him of. You sold us all off into slavery. You've sold us all, all off into slavery to pay your debt. And he says, if you feel like property that's been sold off to pay the debt to my creditors, um, he asks them this question. Think about that. D think about that. To who am I indebted on this earth? Who are my creditors? To whom do I owe anything? No, the truth is you're experiencing the consequences of your own sin. When God established his covenant with them at Mount Sinai, along with all of the blessings and the uh, the benefits of this covenant relationship came a warning of what would happen if they were unfaithful to him, if they were disobedient to him, if they chose to worship other gods. I mean, that was the first one, right? You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make any uh, images. And what's the very first thing, even as he's getting the Ten Commandments, Moses is getting the Ten Commandments up on Mount Sinai, the very first thing they do is break number one and two. And then a few more along the way as they're partying. And God's like, I haven't, even, I haven't even finished writing this. He's like, you better get down there before I do. Don't make me come back there, right? And, and uh, man, he says, I haven't been unfaithful. I promised that I would go before you and I would protect you and I'd fight your battles and I'd, I'd bless you and I'd give you a land and I'd give you a people and you who are not a nation are going to be a great nation and through you all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. I'm going to, through your seed, I'm going to send a Savior that's not just be a Savior of the Messiah, the Yeshua HaMashiach for the Jews, but the Savior of the world. And all I ask in return is that you love me, that you worship me, that you stay faithful to me. That's kind of a basic requirement. We've been talking about that a lot in our household with uh, uh, Mia and Jarrett. They wrote their own vows, and they were incredible. They're a whole lot easier to write than to keep, though, aren't they? They're a whole lot easier to say than do. You know, most people, when they say for better, for worse, they mean for better. And, and, and for sickness and in health, they mean health. And for richer and for poorer, they mean richer. Because when sickness and poorer and, and, and worse comes, uh, people get a little antsy. This isn't what I thought it was going to be. You're not meeting all my needs. Uh, uh, the grass is greener on the other side of the fence. You're not keeping up your side of the bargain. They're blaming God for his unfaithfulness. He says, I didn't go anywhere. You left me. You're experiencing the consequences of your own unfaithfulness. And he promised them that if they refused to obey, that this is what was going to happen. He even said this back in Deuteronomy when Moses gave him his final message. If you 
disobey me if you choose to wander off and, and commit spiritual adultery. He said it worse than that. He says, go a whoring after other gods. Then I'm going to have to remove my hand of blessing and I'm going to allow the nations around you to conquer you. And this is exactly what he said would happen. I don't know why they're surprised. And yet God is merciful and gracious and long-suffering and he still loves them, and he hasn't abandoned them, and he hasn't forgotten them, and he's going to rebuild them. He's promised. He says, yes, I've disciplined you as any good father would, but it's for the purpose of reconciliation and restoration and to rebuild and restore. And the truth is that they had abandoned him, not he them. And so once again, the issue of possibility and impossibility is at the heart of what was happening here. From a human perspective, it's impossible for Israel to be restored back to relationship. This just, it's, it, it can't happen. There's too many barriers. That's why God said, I'll move mountains. I'll raise up roads. I'm going to uh, uh, dry up rivers to get you home to me. All of this confirms two things for God's people. Number one, I, the Lord, am your Savior, your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. I alone am God, and there's nothing too difficult for me. I can do this. And number two, those who wait on me, trust in me, hope in me, will not be disappointed. I will keep my word. God, who cannot lie, always keeps his promises. The God who can and did defeat the Assyrians, remember that? Angel of the Lord went out one night, 185,000 killed in the army of Sennacherib. One angel, one night, 185,000. God didn't even bother to do it himself. He's like, Gabe, go get it done. One night, 185,000. This is the kind of power of our God. He, he raises up kings. King Cyrus, the great of Persia, with the great, one of the greatest Persian kings he, sent, he used to send his people back. And he can defeat the evil one, the little G God of this world, the prince of the power of the air, right? He can defeat the evil one who has held you captive, has control in your life, has the power of sin in your life. He's not going to force himself on you, though. He's not going to do these things for you against your will if you don't give him the opportunity. No one's saved against their will. You've got to respond and turn back to him in repentance and faith and put your hope and trust in him. Wait on him. Let's look at the last two verses for today. God said, when I came, why was there no one? When I called to you, why was there no one to answer? Was my, my arm too short to, to deliver you? Was, do I lack strength to rescue you and save you? By a mere rebuke, I dry up the sea. I turn rivers into a desert. The fish rot for lack of water and die of thirst. I'm the one that clothes the heaven in darkness. I make sackcloth its covering. Do you think that I can't do this? I'm the maker of heaven and earth. I, I command the stars and they shine, right? This is, this is not too hard for me. Notice that all the initiative and all the power is from God and not from us. He's the faithful one. He's the reconciling one. He's the restoring one. He's the one who, who comes to us when we could not come to him. We can't rescue ourselves. We're powerless. We lack the strength. We lack the willpower. We lack the desire. We lack the desire. Babylon's looking pretty good to us at times. We get pretty comfortable in our lives. We're good, Lord. You know, when things turn south, maybe I'll cry out to you, but I'm doing pretty well right now. We lack the desire to come to him. So he came to us when we couldn't come to him. When we were powerless in our captivity, Paul puts it this way, you were dead, separated from God in our transgressions and sins. And we were slaves to the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, that's Satan. And all of us lived among them, gratifying the desires and cravings of our own flesh. We were following around our own fleshly. That's why it's dangerous, by the way, that whole mantra that we've got today. Follow your heart. Follow your heart. You don't want, you, no. I know some of your hearts. We've talked, we've had some heart to heart talks and there's some darkness there. There's some darkness in my heart. I don't want to follow it. It's going to, it's the primrose path to hell. And all of us were at one time gratifying the cravings of our flesh, following our desires and thoughts. It's not just our actions. It's actually our sinful desires that are, that are enslaving us as well. Like the rest, we were deserving of God's wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, he made us alive with Christ even when we were dead. 
That's how God showed his love for us. He proved his love. He demonstrated his love for us. Even while we were still shaking our fists in rebellion against him, he sent Christ to be the light of the world into our darkness to redeem us and save us from ourselves. Rich in mercy, even when we were dead in transgressions and sins, he is by grace you have been saved. So as a result of the power of God that saves us in Romans 8, Paul asks, if God is for us, then who can be against us? The one who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, will he not also graciously give us all things? He gave us the most important thing. All the rest is gravy, right? Who, all, who can bring a charge against God, God, God's elect or God's, who, those who God has chosen? It is God who justifies. So who can condemn us if God declares us his children? Who can say we're not? No one. Christ died, even more than that, he was raised to life. He's now seated at the right hand of God, and he's interceding for you. He's advocating for you right now before the throne of the Father. And then he says, because of that, who can separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, or hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? He says, no. In all of these things, we are more than conquerors. Why? Because we're strong? No, but because our God is. Our Savior is. We're more than conquerors through him who loved us. I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor the present, nor the future, nor any other power, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Do you believe that? If you do, then why do you and I so often try to snatch defeat from the jaws of that victory? That's a declaration of victory on your behalf. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. That's victory. The victory is ours. His victory on the cross and over, over uh, death and over sin and over hell is our victory. He's imputed it to our account through repentance and faith. God has conquered sin and death in order to rescue you. So here's the question. Is there anything that he can't overcome? In fact, we're declared overcomers with him. No, he's strong. He's capable. Nothing is too difficult. Nothing is impossible with God. So then he asks again his people, why when I called, you didn't respond? When I offered rescue and salvation, did you not? When I reached out my hand and offered you salvation, did you not take it? Why not? If you aren't experiencing God's Salvation, his deliverance, his saving power in your life today. It isn't because God isn't willing and able to save you. If you're not experiencing God's saving power in your life today, it isn't because God isn't willing and able to save you. He's reaching out his hand. He's calling out to you right now. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Whosoever will may come. So we need to refocus today on these promises that God has made to his people, right? Remind yourself of who he is and all that he's pledged to you. What did he say? I will not forget you. A mother with a nursing infant is sooner to, sooner to forget her child than I will forget you. I, I've carved your names on my hands so that I will never forget you. I've pierced my hands out of love for you, right? What else did he say? I will never leave you or forsake you. I am with you. I'm going to restore you. I'm going to rebuild you. I'm going to fight for you. And I'm going to win. I've already overcome the world. I've already overcome sin and death. And I'm going to rescue you out of your captivity to sin and to Satan and to death. These covenant promises of the sovereign, faithful creator God are as much for you today as they were for the people of Isaiah's day. Why? Because they're rooted in the very nature and character of God who does not change and cannot lie. Number two, because he sent Jesus to renew his covenant promises, not just to the Jews, but to all who would believe in him and receive him as Savior and Lord. And so when you understand who he is and what he's done for you, the powerful truth of it will bring you out of that depression, out of that despondency, out of that woe is me. Um, I'm in, I, there is no hope for me in this world attitude and into the joy and the peace of the children of light you are a child of god if you've placed your faith in him you are a child of the light start believing it start hoping in him get your eyes on him remember the promises he's made to you so the question or problem of faithfulness is never with god and has never been with god 
He's eternally faithful and true. We read that about him before. His, 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 he is a good and faithful God, and his mercies and are, are new to us and every morning. Great is his faithfulness. See, where the relationship breaks down, where doubt and fear and unbelief and blame and lack of trust come in and separate us from God is, is on us. See, we forget God's promises and instead believe the lies of the enemy. We believe that they're stronger than God. And we're still trying to blame God for all the bad things that have happened in my life instead of falling at his feet in gratitude and thankfulness and repentance and faith and saying, you alone are God and you alone can save me. My hope is in you. Jesus even wondered out loud to his disciples in the New Testament in Luke chapter 18. He says, when I return, am I going to find faith on the earth? Because our faith leaks out just like it did in his disciples. Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Put your hope in God. And this is what David says in Psalm 42 and 43. Why so downcast on my soul? I will put my hope in God for I, he is my savior and my God. And I will yet trust in him. Today, God's reminding you of who he is and what he has promised. His promises are true. His promises are sure. He is faithful and true. And he's calling you to respond to him. Will you? Let's pray. Father, we're grateful for your word that's powerful. It's living and active. It's not a dry, dusty history book. It's, it's the living and active word of the living and active God who has not only created all that is, but he's spoken into this world and he's called out a people to himself. And he's still calling out, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Thank you, God, for loving us and sending your son into the world, the darkness of this world, the brokenness of this world, to release the captives, to set us free, to proclaim good news to the captives and freedom to the prisoners, sight to the blind, new life to those who were dead, to set us free, say, come out, be free. Be reconciled to God. I'm going to make you new. And I'm not just going to make you new. I'm going to make all things new. So wait in me, hope in me, trust in me. And if you have never placed your faith in Jesus Christ, may today be the day that you reach out and take his offer of salvation. We couldn't come to him, so he came to us. Thank you for your grace, Father. Thank you for your love, Jesus. And thank you for your convicting, drawing work, Spirit. Do your work in us. And help us to reminded, be reminded of your promises today that I will not forget you. I will not leave you or forsake you. I will, I will fight for you. I will rebuild you. I will be victorious over your enemies. You can trust me. You can hope in me. Help us to take heart and be encouraged in God our Savior today. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within. Upward I look and see him there who made an end of all my sin. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul take heart this morning. You haven't gone too far. It's not too late. God is not distant. He's not a God that's a far off. He's a God who's near. And he says, if you draw near to him, he'll draw near to you. So you can cry out to him in repentance and faith, and he will always hear that prayer. If you're not sure what that looks like, how to have a relationship with God, come talk with me. I'd love to talk with you about that and pray with you about that. And for those of you believers who've forgotten who God is and think that he's abandoned you and things are looking bleak, remember, he hasn't forgotten you. He's promised to build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He's going to fight for us against those who contend with us. And he has already overcome the world. So we don't have to lose heart and lose hope. He wins. We're on the winning team. And take your, put your hope in God and trust in God. And, and maybe we need to change the negative self-talk to, to the truth of God. I will not forget you. I will rebuild you. I will fight for you. I am with you and I will never leave you or forsake you. And you can put your hope in him today. All right. Be encouraged. And go and, uh, and live for the living God. We'll see you next time.